Phil is here to take us into the post-MTD future. Phil Sayers, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, John. I'm a bit of a nomad. I've lived all over the country, and these days I live down south, so it's always great to come back to the northwest, which I really regard as my home, because it means instead of saying things like bath and grass, I can pronounce things properly. I can say bath and grass, and I can say things like tin, 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 and everybody understands what you're talking about. I, I spent most of my school years in Macclesfield, just a little bit further south. It's... Um, and that's really where I view as, a, as home. It's, it's, it's the only town I know of that has a ring road that goes through the middle. But it's always, always good to be back in the northwest. But there are a few familiar faces in the room today, but I'm guessing most of you really don't know who I am or what my background is, or even what sort of credentials I have to be talking to you about what future options may be open to you as, as accountants in practice. So hate to tell you, because salespeople and accountants are usually not a good combination, but I've been in sales all my life, as a salesman, sales director, and as John rightly said, most recently as an interim CEO at Clearbooks. But I've worked within the sort of accountancy world in two phases in my career. In the 90s, I had my own business as a, as a pretty successful sage reseller. And it's showing my age, really, because I was transitioning the move from DOS to Windows, which was an interesting exercise. Then I moved off and did a, did a few other things, and then came back in about three years ago when I, when I first joined Clearbooks. Um, but it's given me, certainly the last two or three years, it's given me a real insight into the changes that have been going on within the accountancy profession. And certainly in my role at Clearbooks, but also sitting on the general council of BASDA, which is the sort of trade body for software developers in this space, had lots and lots of dealings with HMRC, both trying to hammer into their heads the realities of what was required for software developers to enable you as practicing accountants to, to help your clients comply with MTD, but also trying to get the communication right. So it's been an interesting exercise. Secondly, for most of my career, I've worked with SMEs, I've worked for SMEs, I've run SMEs, and nowadays you know, I provide advice and help and support and coaching to SMEs as well. But the other side to what I do is I work hand in hand with accountants. So if you have clients who are struggling to sell or maybe they need to turn around, they want to scale up and don't understand how to do that and make their sales activities more effective, typically that's where, where I, would, I would get involved. John mentioned the gap. Um, this is not meant to be a sales pitch. The gap is a bit of software that enables accountants to market, sell, and deliver advisory services. I know at least one's going to put his hand up here, but has anybody come across the gap? Good for you, Mark. OK, I, need... <laughs> um, I was hoping there was going to be an existing user here as well today, but, but he clearly has not been able to make it. I will touch on this later on but this is not meant to be a sales pitch. The final bit is I also recently published a, a book which is really designed for SMEs, and it's a real simple step-by-step -step guide to the things that they should be considering in how to improve their sales effectiveness. And interestingly, although when I wrote it, it was designed for SMEs, I've also had a lot of interest from accountants because clearly selling and accountancy are typically not two things, that are not things that go together. And yet... A lot of the time, when you're talking to your clients, you are actually selling. Now, if we look at MTD and the impact of it, we've touched on some of these things already. The way I view MTD in terms of the, the impact it's having on, on you as accountants is really in three areas. One is in terms of driving and enabling you to deliver operational efficiencies internally. And that's, that's been going hand in hand with the, with the increased and accelerated adoption of, of cloud software. The second piece is that clearly it's, it's generating an increased demand for software, certainly over the last two years. And you've seen that rate of adoption has taken off. And certainly for most of the software vendors, they are, to be, to be frank, you know, rubbing their hands together with glee because there is this sudden surge in demand for, for their products. The third piece is it's also driving an increased demand for support from you as the people who look after your clients. And Matt mentioned this earlier on, and when I talk about support, I'm not just talking about technical support in using the software, although clearly that's a big element to it. But the other side is it's raising lots of questions in clients' minds as to how they should be running their business and aspects that they want advice and help on. And logically, they will tend to, to turn to you as the accountant for that advice. Now, these changes, these, this, these impacts, um, are in many ways good for you because they will enable you to 
uh, run potentially more efficient practices, potentially add, uh, um, offer more advisory services to your clients. But it's also um, driving efficiencies within the clients as well. But as accountants, once you start adopting the technology and more of you start to do it, the other thing, and certainly one of the things I've seen over the last sort of four or five years is that there's been this four or five years is that there's been this huge downward pressure that is driving fees for pure compliance work to a lower and lower point. And it's what was really interesting for me is when I set up Proton Sales Development, I needed an accountant. So I was shopping around for somebody I could work with. And I did what most sort of buyers do these days, which is I did a quick Google search. I found a list of about 12 or 15 accountants who were relatively local to me. I rang up nine of them and asked for an appointment. So could I come and talk to you about how we could work together and how you can help me? And the response was fascinating for me, given my background. Of those nine, I managed to speak to somebody at six of them immediately and make an appointment to go and visit. Of the remaining three, one called me back within two hours and I went to see them. One called me back later that same day. The third one I'm still waiting for. They never even returned my call, which is quite frightening if the objective of the accountancy practice in question is to try and attract new clients. So I've never spoken to them. When I went to see the rest of them, most of them, interestingly, had a very, very similar approach, which was to welcome me in, give me a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, and then talk to me about the services that they provide. And it was a standard set of services that they clearly deliver to pretty much every new client that they bring on board. But two stood out. And what those two did, which was radically different to the rest, was that they didn't talk about the services that they provided. They sat me down and wanted to understand who I was, what was important to me, what I wanted to do with my business, what were the challenges I thought I might be facing, and even suggested some others that I hadn't thought about, and then and only then talked to me about the services that they could provide. And those two were immediately at the top of my list, and it became actually quite a difficult decision to select one above the other, but I did. But it struck me at the time because a lot of what I've done historically as a salesman and when I'm working with SMEs is to help them understand how to go through that process. And if all you do is you have a website that lists all of your services that looks exactly the same list as every other accountant that you're competing against, then almost inevitably any client who visits your website is going to focus on the price because it's the only thing that's different. So the key, the key um, message I would give to you as people who are trying to sell services, whether they're compliance related services or anything else to clients, is you need to, need to uh, and communicate really strongly what the commercial value is to your clients of what you do. If you don't do that, your potential clients are just going to look at the price and not a lot else. Now, <coughs> with all of that in mind, there are things, other things that you might want to consider doing within your practice to, to differentiate yourself over everybody else. But hands up, who's fed up of being told that the future is advisory services and that compliance is dead? Only one. I'm amazed. I thought it was going to be most of you. Because, because I see a lot of, lot of messaging on social media and in the press from people who are saying, you know, compliance is dead, it's in decline, you have to get into advisory services. And clearly that's an option for you. But for me, it's, it's the wrong starting point. For me, the starting point is, and this is my first big question to you, is what's your priority? Because it would be hugely arrogant of me to stand up here and say to each and every one of you, well, you know, compliance is going to decline over the next five years. If you're going to survive, you've got to get into advisory services. But you wouldn't take that approach with one of your clients. You wouldn't sit in front of one of your clients and say, I think there's something else you could be doing. I think we need to radically change your business model without really understanding what was important to your client and what their personal goals were, what their business objectives were, what they're, tr what they're in business for in the first place. Now, I'm not a great fan of trying to pigeonhole businesses into different categories, but for illustrative purposes, it can be quite useful. And when I talk to accountancy practices, very, very broadly speaking, I see them falling into four categories. 
And the first of those are those that are very much lifestyle businesses. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. These types of businesses are run by people who, whose primary objective is to generate a, a set level of income that enables them to support a particular lifestyle. And it may be that they're you know, working towards retirement or they want to have three or four holidays a year or increasingly, particularly with, with, with mums with young families, they want to work part-time so that they can support the family and they, and they want to spend more time with their family perhaps. The second group I see are those that are, that are focused on growing their practice. And that growth is coming from a number of areas. In some cases, it's coming from increasing the number of clients that they, that they look after, supported very much into, um, by the adoption of new technology. In others, it's, it's growth that's coming from offering increased, an increased range of different services to their clients. So they're moving away from the, the pure compliance model and offering a whole range of different advisory services. The third group have a very specific endpoint in mind, and they're typically my sort of age. They're thinking towards retirement, or they're looking at the future of the firm, perhaps handing it over to the children, Rebecca, <laughs> perhaps to a, you know, a trusted employee. But they've got a very specific endpoint in mind that they're, they're looking to retire, or they're looking to sell the business, or whatever that may be. And the fourth group have taken a strategic decision that they want to focus on a particular type of client. And there's some really good examples of this in the UK where um, I see group, uh, accountants in practice who've decided that they only want to work with clients in a particular vertical market. That's their specialism. They position themselves as being the expert in that particular market and the challenges that, that their clients who operate in those markets see from day to day. There's lots of overlap in there, clearly, which is why I'm not a huge fan of pigeonholing practices into, into one or other of the, those categories. But I would suggest that the starting point for any of you who, can, who are considering changing the way that, in which you operate is to start with this question. What's your priority? Why are you in business in the first place? What is, it, what is it you're trying to do for your clients? What are your business objectives, not just in the next 12 months, but over the next four to five years or maybe beyond? But also, what are your personal goals and objectives? Then, and only then, are you going to be in a position to decide in what direction you want to take your business. And it's exactly the same process that you would go through if you were talking to one of your clients about what's the future for them. Now, <coughs> Gary Turner doesn't need any more publicity. He's very good at doing that himself. But Zero did, did produce a report recently, which is, makes really, really interesting reading around how practices are evolving and the types of advisory services that they're starting to get involved with. The report itself was actually focused around New Zealand, Australia and the US rather than the, the UK. But in reality, when you look at the, the statistics and the data that, that it uh, highlights, you can see exactly the same thing happening in the UK at the moment. It's called the Accounting and Bookkeeping Industry Performance Report. It's on the, the Zero website if you want to take a look at it. Um, and what Xero have done, again, it's, it's pigeonholing practices, which can be a little bit dangerous, but they've identified three types of practice within the accounting world. The first of those, no surprising, is the compliance model. So these are the practices that are focusing on bookkeeping, accounting, VAT returns, tax returns, year-end accounts. <clears throat> and they make up the majority, certainly at the moment, in the UK. The second group, Zero refer to them as simple advisory. And these are the firms that are starting to move into areas outside of the pure compliance piece. It's typically around things like business planning, generating cash flow reports, um, annual reviews with clients, so, but still very much focused around the financial aspects of their clients and how they run their business. The third group... Zero refers to as complex advisory. And these are firms that are moving into much, much wider areas about generally providing help and advice and guidance to their clients in all sorts of different aspects of running a business. And this is really, really quite interesting in terms of the, the direction that some of these firms are taking. And they are very much becoming, as Rebecca calls herself now, business advisors rather than traditional accountants. But what's probably more significant is when you look at the statistics behind these three categorizations. 
And, and the first point that, that, that came out of the report was in terms of the revenues that these types of, types of practices are generating. And for those that fit in the compliance model, they're still doing some advisory work. And, and to be honest, accountants have always provided advice to their clients. They may not have charged for it, but they've always provided some degree of advice. But those that are fitting primarily in the compliance business model are generating a little bit of revenue around advice. So in this case, it was about sort of $54,000 on average per practice. The simple advisory group, once they move beyond into things like business plans and cash flow forecasting and analysis, it increases up to whatever that is, $120,000, $130,000 on average. But then the really startling fact is those that are starting to move into other areas are generating on average about half a million dollars worth of, of revenue purely from advisory services. Now, granted, you'd need to, need to drill down into those numbers to look at the size of the firms that are delivering those services because there will be a proportion who are into the complex piece who are actually pretty sizable practices. And certainly there are different skill sets required to provide some of these advisory services over and above the compliance work. But it's the proportions that, that, that to me, or struck me as, as being interesting in that the opportunity is there if it's something that you want to get into. But I would still come back to the point I made earlier that the starting point is understanding what your goals and what your objectives are and deciding which direction you want to take your practice before just leaping into this sort of stuff. The second set of stats which was interesting was in terms of the growth that these types of, of practices are, are um, enjoying. So for the compliance guys, typically on average they're growing at about 11.5% a year, the simple advisory group growing at 15.3% a year, the complex growing at 19.2% a year. Again, so what it's suggesting is that if, if one of your goals is to grow your business, to grow your, your top line revenue, then there is potentially a significant opportunity for you if you start moving into areas outside of the traditional compliance work. The third one, which was also very telling, was in terms of actually retaining clients. And this, for me, given my background, was also particularly interesting because if you look at the compliance group, they're typically losing about one in eight, eight clients every year. Now, from a sales perspective, every time you lose a client, you're going to have to invest a lot of time and effort and activity into trying to recruit a new one, unless you're particularly efficient at marketing. If you start offering the simple advisory type services, then that client departure rate, the loss rate, reduces to about 7.5%. And at the higher end with the complex advisory, it drops to about 6%. And what that's suggesting is that because the practice is in the simple advisory and complex advisory categories are delivering more or a more varied range of advice to their clients. The clients are, are, are A, perceiving much greater value from it and therefore remaining loyal. We see lots of reference to the term trusted advisor. I, personally, I think it's overused. I first came across it probably in the early 2000s and at the time I was working for large IT software company and there was a big move at the time to to try and get rid of the term salesman and, and replace it with trusted advisor where we would talk to potential customers and rather than trying to promote a particular message we would focus on that particular that potential customers problems and then try and solve those problems using our software. The accountancy profession for me is very different in that you have always provided advice to your clients. And as I said before, whether or not you've charged for it is very much a commercial decision for you to make uh, yourselves. But I read somewhere um, recently that the accountancy profession is the second most trusted profession in the UK, only behind healthcare. Now that's really, really telling. Now, <coughs> if you are providing advice to your clients, it has a huge value. And it, that, the value comes from all of those years that you trained to become qualified accountants. It comes from all of the years you've invested with your clients, <coughs> understanding their businesses and the problems that they face on a day-to-day -to -day basis. And it comes from the value that you're then able to deliver your clients. So a question really for you to consider is, to what extent do you want to continue giving away advice free of charge? 
Now, it's entirely up to you. And if your commercial model says, I only want to deliver compliance services, I will continue to advise my clients free of charge, then that is your decision. But I would strongly suggest that there, are, there is a point at which you decide not to go and to not to continue to provide free advice to clients because that has a real value associated with it. And I have lots of conversations with accountants who say, well, I've been talking to my clients and I've suggested that we should put together a business plan and we should do quarterly cash flow reviews. And they're not interested. They don't want it. And one of the reasons that happens is because of the way it's communicated to the clients. So if I was talking to Rebecca as my accountant and she came to me to say, Phil, look, I've had a look at your accounts for the last year. I think you're doing okay, but I think there's some potential issues. And I've got some ideas as to how, how, how you might be able to improve your performance over the next, ne next um, 12 months. Why don't we sit down, we'll pull together a business plan, and then we'll schedule sort of quarterly cash flow reviews to make sure everything's on track. I'm going to charge you about £1,000 for the service. Is that okay? I'm going to sit there and think, okay, so I'm going to incur another cost of £1,000 a year. I don't really see what's in it for me. So I'm going to say no. If, on the other hand, Rebecca had come to me to said, look, I've had a look at your accounts for the last 12 months. I think there are some really interesting trends in what I'm seeing. And I think there's some challenges around perhaps your pricing strategy, your stock control. I think you've got an issue with debtors that we need to get under control. And as a result of this, I think if we went through the process of creating a detailed business plan together, and also then started to implement some real ca tight cash flow controls and reviews, I think you can improve, improve your bottom line profit next year by 50,000 pounds. It's going to take some time, and it needs some of my time to invest in it, and it's going to cost you, cost you a thousand pounds. Then when I look at that message and think, well, actually, yeah, it's an extra thousand pounds, but if, if she's right, if she delivers on that and, and is able to help me, I'm going to improve my bottom line profit by 50,000 pounds. That's a much more compelling argument and is much more likely to get the buy-in of the client. And the reason I see so many accountants struggle with this is because you're never trained in it. You've trained in a technical area of, of, of expertise and excellence. And then suddenly, either because you've become promoted through the practice or you've set up your own, you're sitting in front of clients and are expected to, to instantly understand the process you need to take your clients through. The real trick, or the real, real art, if you like, of, of, of selling anything is to start with the client and their problems and their challenges, understand the areas that you think you can help them with, and then suggest a way of achieving that and associated cost. And if you do that and, and link the cost to a much greater perceived value, then you're much more likely to be able to get buy-in from your clients and, and, and move the process forward. Now, this is all well and good, but looking at those three business models earlier on, the compliance, the simple advisory, and the complex advisory, if everybody starts off doing the same thing, how do you differentiate yourself? So what are the three areas that potentially you can get involved with? <coughs> and this is, again, is coming from the, from the Zero Report. And those organizations, those practices that operate within the simple advisory service model, there's a few things that they're starting to get involved with. The first one, we've already been hearing about it earlier on, is all around software and app implementation. And there is a value associated with that. And it's entirely a commercial decision of, uh, of yours as to whether or not you want to, want to charge your client for it. The second piece is around startup mentoring and simple business development activities. The third one is that budgeting, cash flow, and planning element. Now that's the interesting one for me because that's slap bang in the middle of your own areas of expertise. And actually when you look at the breakdown of revenue that practices are generating from these three types of, of services, the software implementation bit, 18%, startup mentoring and business development, 22%, but the bulk of it, 60%, is coming from that budgeting, forecasting and planning service. 
If you position the value of it correctly with your clients, then you're more likely to get success from delivering it. But the nice thing about it is, as I said, this is slap bang in the middle of your area of expertise. This is all around interpreting the numbers that you put together for your client. It's all about looking at the trends of the last 12 months, the last two years, spotting problems before they become major issues, and then providing real sort of specialist guidance and advice to your clients as to how to address those challenges before they become big, big problems. When you then look at the complex advisory services, there's a whole range of things that we see practices moving into now. One is around succession planning, and this is particularly for you know, family-owned um, businesses and help, helping your client think about what happens when the head of the business retires. Are we going to hand it down to, to members of the family, or are you going to exit and sell the business? There are aspects around simple HR advisory pieces, so things like basic HR empl um, employment law and employment contracts. Performance benchmarking is an interesting one, particularly for those practices who've focused on particular vertical markets. So if you've got lots of clients operating in a similar market, being able to provide comparative analytics to a particular client to say, well, you're growing at X percent, but did you realize that the other people in your similar market are growing at Y percent? Then perhaps there are some lessons to learn from that and conclusions that can be drawn. And the raising capital piece, again, for me, is an interesting one. If I go back sort of 15 years, if you had a client who wanted to raise capital for whatever, typically they go and see the bank manager. It doesn't work anymore. For SMEs, the banks are not interested. So they need to look for alternative sources. But there's now far more options available, whether it's through VCs, angel, angel investors, or a whole raft of, of applications that provide um, financial support. So things like iWalker, Citago and so on. So there's a whole range. And that, to a client, can, can be quite a daunting prospect trying to understand which is the most appropriate. And you're the perfectly placed people to be able to provide that advice to the client and give them proper structured advice as to what's the most appropriate way forward. Clearly there are things around business software services and this is not just the support on the Xero and the QuickBooks and the Sage, but particularly for, for clients who are starting to grow and perhaps are outgrowing their existing software and need to move to something more sophistic sophisticated and complex. And then the final one is what's referred to as an outsourced CFO. So these are accountants who are either acting as or actually are a non-exec finance director for their clients. So they're meeting with the clients monthly or quarterly. They're providing detailed financial analysis on the performance of the business and looking towards the future and, and helping the business structure themselves in such a way to take advantage of whatever opportunities are in front of them. And when you look at the split of the revenue, again, it's really telling. So most of them are relatively small. When you get to the sort of business software and app services, it's growing. But the big one, again, is that outsourced CFO role. And again, it's no surprise because that's where your area of expertise is. And the key, key challenge for you, really, is positioning the value of your expertise and your experience to your client in such a way that they see that, yes, there is, it is worthwhile for them to get involved utilizing your services in this sort of fashion. The final piece is, is what you might call specialist advisory services. So we've got things like HR, so moving beyond simple employment contracts. We've got R&D. I'm not talking about R&D tax credits here. I'm talking about sort of manufacturing companies who need specialist advice around R&D functions and processes. We've got manufacturing, we've got marketing, we've got sales, which is where I sit. So many of the accountants I work with, I will go and then work with their clients to help them improve the effectiveness of their selling. And when it works best is when the accountant is doing that business planning and forecasting process with the client, because then I can help the client build a sales model that helps them achieve the objectives and the targets that you've set in the business plan. And that then provides the KPIs and the measurements and the performance metrics that will feed back into your monthly or quarterly reviews with your clients and help you build next year's business plan. And that's really where the gap fits. So this is not meant to be a pitch sales pitch for the gap, but just so you understand the context of it. So the gap is a bit of software. It was developed by two practicing accountants in New Zealand. <coughs> Mark, who was in practice for 17 years, <laughs> Viv for 25 years. Mark, in particular, developed his practice around these advisory services pieces. And over the years, 
he pulled together a whole range of content and supporting material and processes to make his own practice really, really efficient at identifying opportunities for advisory services and then delivering them in a consistent and repeatable way. And the way he looks at the world is that for most practices, the compliance piece and possibly the wealth management piece, whether that's de delivered in-house or through an independent financial advisor, that's the core of where most practices come from. But the simple place to start in terms of providing um, incremental value to your client is to look at what he calls the business development trifecta. And that's around the business planning, the cash flow forecasting, and the ongoing reporting and accountability. Because it's a relatively easy, easy area for you to move into and an area that's easy for you to discuss with your clients. And then beyond that, if you want to take it further, is the other outlying areas. So things like marketing plans, value-based selling, succession planning, and general business development. And that moves you into areas of becoming almost like a coach or a mentor or an advisor to your clients. But it's all done in a, in a repeatable, structured way. Which then brings me to the, my, my second big question for you, is to say, well, OK, there's lots of options that you might want to get involved with, you, with your practice, but where do you go from here? So my starting point would be, Assuming you want to consider getting into the advisory services side, first and foremost, select the business model that best fits your clients, your employees, and your own personal ambitions. As I said at the start, you would never go to a client and say, I've got this great idea, we want to radically change your entire business model without understanding what their own objectives are. The same applies to making changes within your own practice. Second one is, Look for technology to help you reduce the time it takes to service clients in exactly the same way that you're doing with cloud accounting apps, with receipt capture apps, with banking apps and so on. There is technology available that can help you market, sell and deliver advisory services in a structured way. The third one is also decide which services you as individuals can offer and which ones you want to use specialists for. So you don't have to be all things to all men. But, but first and foremost, talk to your clients. What's really interesting is when you look at practices that have taken this route, they start off typically in a relatively small way. And they'll just pick on two or three of their closest clients and start to have much more generic business discussions with them. So rather than just looking at the tax affairs and the year-end results, they're starting to explore what the, what the client wants to do, where the client wants to be in five or ten years' time. And having those much more open discussions will, will trigger all sorts of potential new opportunities for you. And then really some final thoughts for you. You don't need to have a huge marketing budget to get involved in this sort of thing. It doesn't need to be a hugely costly exercise. So use networking events, use referrals, use social media and start to, to trigger debates with your clients. But first, uh, fundamentally, talk to, your, talk to your clients. Understand what they're trying to achieve and how you might be able to help them, uh, help them do that. And the second one I would certainly suggest is eat your own dog food. So if you're going to offer advisory services to your clients, use those same services on your own business. So if you're not already doing it, create your own business plan. Put in place your own reporting and, and performance review processes and use that with, with, with yourself and your teams, depending on the size of your practice. But also work with other accountants. Not everybody is your competitor. And you will find, even, even in the room of this size, you will find other people who have similar business models to you, have similar ambitions to you, and you could quite easily bounce ideas and, uh, and suggestions and questions off each other. So use that shared, that shared knowledge and, and, and grow accordingly. One word of caution, the complex advisory services definitely generate more revenue per employee, but there is a cost associated with it because as those employees then start to take on board and develop different skill sets, their salary expectations will increase as well. However, there's also a positive to that in that for those employees who want to get involved in this sort of activity and this sort of work, is potentially giving them a much more varied um, career development path. Now, it is really interesting. There are lots of people within the accounting profession who got into it because it is a technical area of expertise. And all they want to do is sit in front of a screen, crunch the numbers, do the detailed analysis, do the detailed reporting. If that's their focus, don't try and get them involved in advisory work. 
because it will be a complete anathema to, to them. If you've got people in your teams who are very much more people focused and really good at building relationships, they're the starting point. They're the ones who are more likely to be able to, to get involved in this sort of aspect. And then really some final thoughts for you. Moving from a pure compliance model into any form of advisory um, approach and advisory service, it does require planning, it does require processes, and I would strongly recommend you put in technologies to help you support that and, and maximise the return on investment. So don't try and just leap into it straight away. Go step by step. Take small steps and talk to two or three clients um, and try and identify the things of value that you could potentially offer to them. And then focus on what you're good at and use, use specialists in other areas. <coughs> and then the third one is position yourself as the go-to source of all advice from your clients. I said before that the accountant, accounting profession is the second most trusted profession behind healthcare. Focus on that. Use it. You're trusted for a reason. It's because you have that experience, you have that expertise that your clients value. So focus on, on being the, the, the go-to source. So even if you don't know the answers for your clients, if you know where you can get the answers from, your clients will continue to come back to you every time they've got a question about anything to do with running their business. And if you do all of that, I would suggest two things happen. One is you end up with a group of really successful and possibly more importantly, loyal clients who will want to continue working with you. And secondly, you'll have a healthy, and if you want it to be, a growing practice. Okay. Happy to answer any questions. If any of you want to look more about, the, uh, look at more detail about the gap or what else I, uh, I do when working with accountants, please feel free to contact me at a later stage. But for now, any questions? Where are we all? Uh, anyone? Uh, okay, okay, well, I guess you've stunned them with, with the future. The <laughs> I've either the stunned, future, stunned them or bored um, them, one or the other. Possibly, for the, if, you, if you kind of think about the setting we're in, that every, everyone's come out here, you know, for nuts and bolts of MTD, uh, I think you, we might be encountering the kind of chicken and egg mm. situation here if, if, of, um, yeah, love to aspire to, to, to be advisory and, and have this the new firm model but I can't you know how can I start how can I get that done when, when actually 80 percent of my clients is a compliance mess and it's going to be a, you know I, I can't focus on the future because I'm stuck here how, how, when you've encountered firm you know that that situation in firms you dealt with <coughs> What is your answer and what kinds of things do you get them to, to look at and to try and do? Sure. The starting point is the question of whether or not you even want to get involved in advisory services work. But if you do, there are some logical points during the year when it's, when it's a good, good place to start. <coughs> and I would suggest two things. One is pick clients that you already have a decent relationship. Maybe you've been working with them for two or three years, so there's, there's a track, track record, there's history. And then kick off the conversation when you've done their last set of year-end accounts. Because you've then got some historical data that you can look at, you can analyse, you can see if you can spot any recurring trends. And then just say to the client, look, I've done your year-end accounts, let's spend an hour looking at them because I've got some ideas as to potentially how we can help. So you don't need to dive in straight away and do it piecemeal. And do it one client at a time. So don't think that it's this huge major transition that you need to go into. But the successful ones are the ones that you know, do it in a structured and, and process-driven way. In the same way that Matt was talking earlier on about having a plan as to how you convert your clients to become MTD compliant, you can take exactly the same approach with your clients on as to which ones you think are appropriate targets for, for talking about advisory services. Thank you. Um, and as, um, I think as a final one, this, this could be... Uh, Throwing, you know, throwing a cat amongst the pigeons here. Whether do, do many of you have freelance and contractor clients? Is that quite a significant part of your user base? We've got a few nods. Okay. Um, one of the models you talked about was the compliance model. That that you know maybe you could just be re use all the tools that we're going to see today and be really efficient. And you can call for support on this question. But um, both with. MTD for income tax coming, where 
more and more of the, the business reports will, will be driven by HMRC on a quarterly basis and possibly the imposition of the off-payroll rules for IR35, which we've seen already in, in the public sector, sure. have driven a lot of people into umbrelling. What do you think the um, outlook is like and what do you think the business model adjustments might need to be for people with significant contractor and freelance customer bases? And we might want to ask Rebecca to come in on that as well. <laughs> but start with you. Yeah, of course. I mean, I, as I said at the start, I don't subscribe to this message that compliance is dead or it's declining. It's changing. It's certainly changing and technology is helping support that. But if you want to focus your, your practice in that aspect and you've got clients who typically are not going to benefit from having other you know, associated advisory services, then by all means focus on it and use technology to make yourself more operationally efficient. But as John says, as, as, as MTD starts to roll out and it starts to incorporate income tax and maybe you've got clients who are, who are tied up with IR35, then I think this, that you have to ask the question of yourselves is, to what extent am I prepared to invest hours and hours of my time supporting clients using my expertise and my knowledge and my skill and not getting any reward for it? And I can't answer that question for you. You're the only people who can answer that question. It comes back to a fundamental point of why are you in business? What do you want to do? And what do you want to deliver to, to deliver to your clients? It's a difficult one, and I don't think there's any right or wrong answer. Okay. Rebecca? Uh, yeah, let me just uh, come to the mic. Um, again, a really fascinating uh, tool to me as someone in practice, uh, because what it made me do, and I've been writing notes fran uh, frantically, is think about what I've started with this creature I've created um, and where I'm going with it. Um, and I thought you might like a real, just simple, practical example of what I've done in terms of an advisory. We took on a client um, in, a, in the summer, uh, a pub. Uh, I've already mentioned my daughter works as a barmaid a couple of nights a week, and we took on this pub, and uh, we had to move her from weekly takings to daily takings, ready for MTD. So we said, OK, you produce this and then we'll run with it. And what my daughter did, which was inspired, and I've got to give it to her, is instead of creating one turnover account, she created 14. Wet sales, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and food sales, Monday through to Sunday. And at the end of the first back quarter, we went back to see the client. I went through explaining how I want you to authorise me to submit a VAT return. And my daughter presented and she said, do you realise that on Mondays and Tuesdays, you do less than half a percent of your week's turnover in food sales? But in order for you to be in the kitchen, you employ someone to be on the bar. And that's £80 a week. And you're not even turning over £80. And she stopped doing food on Mondays and Tuesdays. Now, what enabled us to do that? Fantastic insight from Dorsa, <coughs> who I've now decided is the pub expert. And we're going to go out and get pubs. And, we, and she understands tide pubs, more profit, land, um, enterprise up the rent, and all of that sort of thing. But also, the fact that we had last quarter's figures now. Not late January, because you didn't bring your books in until Christmas Eve. And I've now been frantically trying to get it out the door by the 31st of January. So, and, and that is just organic. I didn't have this great light. I didn't have somebody brilliant like Phil to come along and tell me, this is what you need to think about. It just sort of happened but I thought you might like to sort of understand that that's actually how it can happen, and which is why we're now business advisors rather than just doing the compliance. Everyone will need tax returns filed or whatever they're called then, but actually what they really need is someone like you lot who really understand it. So, client for life. The, the publicans um, re reply to me, I never knew I could get the information like this. It's a bit of a cliche, but 
when you look at your clients, there will be things they know. There will be subject matters they know. There will be things they <coughs> know they don't know, and they're the things typically they come and ask you about. But there's a much, much bigger proportion of subjects and topics that they don't know they don't know about. They have no awareness of, the, of them whatsoever. And Rebecca's is a, uh, example there is a perfect example <laughs> of how you can use your expertise and your skill and your experience to really add value to your clients by highlighting things they've never even considered. It probably never even occurred to them to think about, is there a revenue profile across the week from, from food sales or, or drink sales? And I guarantee that you'll have a small number, if not a large number, of clients within your current portfolio who would really appreciate the value that you could deliver if you found or managed to find the time to start looking at their business on their behalf.